And as, as I was thinking about putting this lesson together, I realized I kind of accidentally kind of wanted to tie some of the things in that Mr. Bill has been talking about the last several weeks, about adding to your faith. But I wanted to take it and really kind of put my own spin on it. So tonight I want to think about the overarching topic of growing our faith. Main text is 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 18, but we'll bounce around quite a bit. It really ties into the back half of 2 Peter, which is where uh, we spent the last several Sunday nights studying different things that we ought to add to our faith. But I want to take a little bit more of a wholesale approach as we think about growing our faith here this evening. Peter, wrapping up his entire letter, says, Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The command is for us, quite simply, to grow. And another element of that is growing in our faith. You know, as you think about Jesus' ministry, much of the New Testament, he has a lot of examples, a lot of parables that tie in specifically to plants and to growing things. You think about the parable of the soils. He addresses many times the parable of the mustard seed, the things like the fig tree. It comes into a play in a lot of different ways. And you know, I like plants and I like sermons. So this is just kind of the best of both worlds for me as we think about growing things together. And this ties into really the back end of the idea that we as Christians have of remaining faithful until death. Revelation chapter 2, verse number 10. So we're going to think about the idea of Christianity as something that we ought to grow just as we would any other plant. I'm not talking about all the seeds that Mr. Mike has put in the ground over the last few weeks. This is more, think of the garden, think of the work and the dedication that goes into that day after day after day and maintaining whatever it is, whether it's tomato plants, flowers, whatever the case may be. I want to think about the work that we put into to cultivating something earthly and draw a contrast to that spiritually and think about how we can grow our faith daily. So when it comes to taking care of our garden, the first thing that we've got to do after we've planted the seed is the daily work, taking care of it, watering the garden. You know, if you don't water your garden just about every day, especially right now, it's going to be a pretty tough time. For those of you who drive through Viola and see the flower boxes hanging out, you can definitely tell when Bradley's there and remembers to water the boxes, because if I'm not and I forget, those flowers die pretty quickly. As Christians, what are we doing daily to grow our faith? What are we doing to water our faith on a daily basis? Are we putting in the legwork? It doesn't have to be all day, every day. You don't just stand out in a garden all day with your watering can. But are we taking time every day to do some kind of work to grow our faith? And what does that look like? I'm reminded of the example of Jesus in Mark chapter 1 verse number 35. If you'll notice that for a moment, Mark chapter 1, verse number 35. Oftentimes it's easy to say, well, I got busy. I've got a lot of other things on my plate. I just don't quite have time to fit something spiritual in every day. Jesus and his earthly ministry had a lot on his plate, if you will. But notice what Jesus does here in Mark chapter 1, verse 35. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. Jesus didn't have time to pray. Jesus made time to pray. That's something for all of us to think about as well. Find time. Make time. Be purposeful. Be diligent on a daily basis to make time to talk to God. It doesn't always have to just be, these are the things I want, these are the things I need. Find time to talk to God, to thank Him for the things that you do have, to reflect on the blessings that He has given to you, to express gratefulness, to express gratitude on a daily basis. We sing the song, count your blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. If you take time to thank God for the blessings in your life, you will realize the great number of blessings in your life. On a daily basis, though, are we spending time in study? Are we deepening our knowledge of God's Word? That's part of this idea of growing. You guys have watched me. Uh, you, of all people, can sympathize, or I can probably sympathize with you. You've watched me grow from a 12-year-old delivering sermons here to I'm going to be 23 in a couple of weeks. I like to think that I've grown a little bit since then. I've gotten a little bit taller, and my voice is slightly less squeaky now. 
But growing comes through study. Growing comes through effort, through work. We throw this out a lot to just say, study God's Word more. But what are some practical approaches to study? It's all well and good to say, yeah, you've got to study daily, but what does that mean? Perhaps it means reading through the Bible in a year, setting a goal for yourself. Perhaps that goal is reading through the Psalms in a year. Perhaps that goal is doing a word study of a particular word in the New Testament. There are a variety of methods. It doesn't just have to be left at study and figure it out. Different things work for different people. Find, though, what works for you and stick to it daily. Find time. Make time to study daily. Just as those in Berea who were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, Acts chapter 17, verse 11, in that they searched the Scriptures daily. I stopped to reflect on it the other day about a, a lot of the things that I had learned in college. I graduated just a little over a year ago, and there were some lessons that I learned that stuck with me that I still use really on a daily or weekly basis with work. There are a lot of things that I learned in college one, two, three, four, five years ago I, I remembered nothing about. Why? Because I don't spend time working on it to remember it, to study it, to make it relevant to me. Because it's not that important. If you do not study God's Word, you will begin to lose it. It's, you have to make a constant habit out of it. You can't just say, well, I've memorized this number of verses, or I know where to find all of these different places in my Bible. It's still something that has to be practiced daily. You think about Bible Bowl ver memory verses that Bill has given here countless times. Do you remember the Bible Bowl memory verses from six months, a year, two, three, four years ago? Probably not. It's something that we have to make a daily habit. But what about one other thing that we can do, perhaps on a daily basis? Be around your brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, it's all well and good when you, you have people that you work with that are also members at perhaps the same congregation or a different congregation. But find ways to surround yourself with the brethren. Whether it's a call, a text message, face-to-face -face time, whatever the case may be, that is something that we can find time to do most days in some form or fashion that will help to grow our faith. Let's notice another passage. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 through 25. Again, this is a passage that I'm sure many of us have read many times over, but it does bear reflecting on as well. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 through 25. It's important to note the, the greater context of this about remembering who we serve, and specifically verse 24, as this oftentimes gets overlooked. Hebrews 10, 24 reads, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. It's a whole lot easier to be involved in love and good works when you're surrounded by other people who have the same mindset that you do. It's okay if you have to do it on your own sometimes, but it makes it significantly easier to surround yourself with people of like, precious faith. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. We oftentimes use this to say, don't skip church on Sunday night and Wednesday night. Obviously, all of you got the memo because it's a Sunday night and you're here. There are a lot of people who didn't remember that, who don't bear that in mind. But daily, seek out opportunities. And it, this is one that doesn't necessarily have to be every day. But find ways to surround yourself with your brothers and sisters in Christ because it will do you good. Go see somebody who's shut in. Charles Talley can't really get out much. Go visit him. There are countless others of the congregation here that could use a visit. Make time, be purposeful about your time, and find a way to encourage your brethren daily because you will be encouraged daily by it. And that's the watering, that's the maintenance, that's the day-to-day -day expectations when it comes to growing our faith. But what happens when it comes to something that may not be daily, but something that's done relatively frequently as well? You know, I, I love going out and, and having the opportunity to plant all sorts of good stuff, but you know what my least favorite thing about it is? Going and pulling weeds. That was the standing joke at my house growing up, and it still is to this way. If you're bored, there's weeds to pull. There's always weeds to pull. Doesn't matter if it's 90 degrees outside or if it's 9 degrees outside. There's always weeds to pull. It's not fun, but it is something that from time to time needs to be done. The same can be said of our faith. 
Jesus paints a beautiful picture when he tells us the parable of the soils over in Matthew chapter 13. It's recorded in the other Gospels as well. But when he paints the, the parable of the four different soils there, there's the wayside soil, there's the shallow soil, the gravel soil, there's the thorny soil, and then there's that good soil. From time to time, we have to examine some of the things that may have become weeds in our faith. Are there negative influences in our environment that poorly impact our faith? Are there people around us? Is there social media intakes that are around us that are negative? There's a variety of negative factors that can negatively impact our faith. From time to time, we have to step back and we have to examine those things. And if necessary, we need to remove those things. You know, the worst place to be right now on the internet, probably the Facebook comment section of any political post. It's horrific. And there are a lot of people who call themselves Christians saying very unchristian like things in the Facebook comment section. Is that really a place that we need to find ourselves oftentimes? You know, I, I was driving back from Atlanta over the weekend and passed a billboard, and it kind of made me stop and think what the intent behind it was. It, had a Bible verse up there, Philippians chapter 2, verse 9. In the last day, every knee shall bow, and below it, it said, even the Democrats. How do you think that reflects on just Christianity as a general rule? Not members of the Lord's church necessarily, but on Christianity in general. Is that the attitude that Christ has commanded us as Christians to have? Absolutely not. That's the type of negative influence, negative thinking that ought to be removed from our faith and from our lives. That is not something appropriate, tolerable, humorous even. That's disturbing. Political affiliation, that's up to you. I'm not standing up here to preach politics, but I saw that and that was kind of the impetus for this lesson about removing negative things. You can have whatever political affiliation you can lay your head down at night having. That's your business. That's my business, what my political affiliation is. But before you identify as a Republican, a Democrat, Libertarian, Independent, anything else, you better be identifying as a Christian. And billboards like that are not solving the problem. They are making it much, much worse. Negative influences have no place in our lives. I taught a lesson about this a couple weeks ago at uh, I believe it was uh, the New Union VBS about influences and things like that, came across a quote that said, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Think about that. You are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Who are you surrounding yourself with the most? Is it negative influences or is it positive influences? Probably your spouse and your kids would rank pretty highly on that list. Perhaps there's quite a few coworkers, things like that on your list. Are the people that you surround yourself with most influencing you for the better, or are they influencing you for the worse? That's something we do have to step back and think about. And at times, just as you've got to pull weeds in the garden, just as sometimes pulling weeds isn't fun, you have to pull the weeds of your faith. Remove the negative influences, remove the negative examples, remove those things. Jesus had to do it. Matthew chapter 16, verse number 23. Turn over there for just a moment. Even Jesus had to practice effectively removing the weeds from time to time. Matthew chapter 16, notice specifically around verse number 23. We've come to, to this point where Jesus has asked this question, who do men say that I am? The apostles have said, you're John the Baptist, Isaiah, one of the prophets. Well, who do you say that I am? Peter said, you're Jesus the Christ. Christ said, yeah, you're correct. I tell you, you're Peter, and upon this rock I shall build my church. The gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. All of this. And then we skip down just a few verses. Verse 21, Jesus has shown to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem to do all of these things. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. You read some of the other gospel accounts, Peter even goes so far as to say, You know, some of these other guys, they might desert you, but I'm never going to desert you. I promise. Jesus 
knowing all things. What does Jesus say here? But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. Peter, you need to stop. Get behind me. Don't tempt me like this. Do we have the boldness to say that to those around us? Don't put me in a position that might cause me to compromise my faith. We have to do that for ourselves. We have to be constantly on guard for situations that may tempt us and do our best to extricate ourselves from those situations. But if there are people that are putting us in those situations, sometimes we need to remove those people from our lives. I would encourage you, in light of this idea, to think about who and what surrounds you and influences you on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. Think about that. Do, for lack of a better term, an audit of what's going into your mind. Who's putting information into your mind? Who's influencing you the most? And ask yourself if that's something that's beneficial or if it's something that's harmful. We can be a light to the world. That is the call. That is the expectation for each of us. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16 details that very clearly. But if we begin to look like the world then that's a problem that we need to step back and examine. Notice, if you will, the first psalm, the first verse, the first couple of verses. The first psalm, the first couple of verses. Psalm chapter 1, verse number 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the paths of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that shall bring forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. What happens when you avoid the ungodly and the scornful? You grow. You grow the way you ought to grow. That's the command for us, is it not? To grow. And sometimes that involves assessing those around us and making sure we aren't doing this, that we are not walking in the counsel of the ungodly, standing in the paths of sinners or sitting in the seat of the scornful. Just as Jesus did, sometimes we've got to pull the weeds. It's not an easy process. Some of these weeds are kind of sticky from time to time. But if there are weeds that are negatively impacting our faith, they must be removed. But lastly, some positive things that we can do for our faith from time to time that may be a little bit out of the ordinary. You know, when you have the opportunity to feed your plants a little bit extra, whether it be compost, fertilizer, whatever the case may be, you do it, and it makes a big difference. Whether it increases how much fruit this particular plant bears, how much it grows, how tall it grows, whatever the case may be. From time to time, it's always a good thing to give your plants some extra nutrients. The same thing can be said of your faith. When it comes to our faith, do we take opportunity, take advantage rather, of opportunities for additional nourishment? I've said this statistic before, I'll say it again. There are 45 churches of Christ in Warren County, Tennessee. There are 45 Churches of Christ within a 45-minute drive of this building. That doesn't happen anywhere else in the world. Talk to, to friends at Freed, and yeah, I preached at six congregations, or I preached at eight congregations. I'm up to 25, going on 30. It's an unheard of number. You know why? Because I've got that many congregations within a 30-minute drive of my house. That is a blessing that we oftentimes, unfortunately, can take for granted, but it is one that we ought to take full advantage of. We've got a gospel meeting coming up here in just a couple of weeks. Brother Eric Owens will be coming up. He does an outstanding job delivering his lessons. I'm certainly looking forward to that. We're going to take full advantage of an opportunity like that. We make jokes about it being vacation Bible school season. We're averaging, what, four different events a week, I think, from May to August. It's crazy. But what a blessing it is to be able to go to edify our faith, to hear something. You know, it's great to hear Bill preach. It's okay to hear me preach. But there are lots of other gospel preachers out there delivering lessons from God's Word that will encourage us and that will build us up. 
that you're going to walk out of every single time saying, you know, I'm glad I went. It may not be easy. I know it's difficult. But are we taking advantage of opportunities like that to build our faith up? Notice an opportunity that Paul presented over in the book of Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Paul's knee-deep in his missionary journeys at this point in time. He's in Greece now. Acts chapter 20, beginning in verse number 7, as Paul is at Troas. Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart to the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. I promise you I'm not going to stay up here for another five and a half hours. But these people were desperate to hear God's word. You know, they could have clocked out after the first hour and said, you know what, that's my three hours on Sunday, I'm good, I'm going home. But they took advantage of hearing a wise man speak. Paul continued till midnight, and and as you read through this, and in the window said a certain man named Eutychus who was sinking into a deep sleep. I get it. You know, it happens. I told Mr. Ed to get back in the car because I was preaching tonight, and he about did, but you know, it's okay. It's not about the preacher. It's about what's being preached. These people were here to hear God's word first and foremost. And they did it for five hours, which seems like a long time. It feels like I had some Fried Hardeman classes that went that long. But make the most of opportunities outside of just Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night to hear God's word. Polishing the pulpits coming up. There's, uh, you know, most of this crowd probably isn't a summer camp crowd, but there's other opportunities to encourage yourself, and more importantly, to encourage others. One of my favorite things about seeing the list that Bill puts together at a gospel meeting or vacation Bible school of how many congregations are represented somewhere. Are we representing Christ, not just on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, but at events on Monday nights, Tuesday nights, Thursday nights, Friday nights, Saturday nights? What about all the other days of the week? Are we out there representing Christ to the best of our ability as well. There is no shortage of opportunities to do so. It may be a little bit of a drive. It may be a little bit inconvenient. But there are countless opportunities to provide your faith further nutrients, whatever that need may be. Again, Bill preaches some outstanding lessons. We're blessed to have him here at Rockcliffe. I like to think that I do okay. But there are a lot of other powerful gospel preachers that can have an enormous impact on your faith if you will make the effort to hear them. So with that being said, I want to ask a simple question tonight. What state of growth is your faith looking like? Let's flip back to Matthew 13 here, and that's where we'll wrap up here in just a few moments. Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, at the end of this chapter, is again where... Really, verse 18 begins where this parable is explained, the parable of the soils that we addressed a few moments ago. But the expectation for us, Jesus details very clearly in Matthew chapter 13, verse 23. We're here. We've made the decision to follow Christ. What's the expectation for us? We're that good soil. Matthew 13, verse 23. But he who received seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. The expectation for us as Christians is to grow our faith and to bear fruit. Remember the fig tree that Jesus cursed? Why did he curse it? Because it looked good. It looked like it should be bearing fruit. But you know what? It had nothing on it. Fortunately, I fear that there are a lot of Christians that the very same thing can be said of. It looks great on the outside. It's a healthy-looking fig tree, but there's no fruit. There's no substance on it. I don't want that to be said of our faith. I want it to be said that we were Christians whose faith continued to grow and to grow and to bear fruit and to bear fruit and to grow some more. But that takes effort on our part. We have to grow our faith. We have to water it daily. We have to examine the weeds. We have to provide it with the nutrients it needs. And that's a labor of love. But in the end, 
that will be worth it. Notice, lastly, this, this parable here told right after the parable of the sower. Verse 24 Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. When the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, no, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. The question is this, are you growing wheat or are you growing tares? I can't answer that question for you. That's a question that you have to ask yourself. What are you growing? Is your faith healthy? Are you nurturing it? Are you nourishing it? Are you watering it? Are you doing the things that are commanded so that we can, in fact, grow? That's the expectation for each of us. That's what Paul details for us. He says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Back to our first passage, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If we do that, our faith will continue to grow and to grow and to grow. Peter uses a very similar analogy. 1 Peter chapters 1 and 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. You look at the cornfields as you drive by. They're constantly growing. Uh, corn doesn't stand still. Hey, you put it in the ground and it seems to pop up and it grows like crazy. I can be gone for a week and come back and it's grown another foot. Brethren, if your faith isn't growing, it's dying. There's no way to put that mildly. If your faith is not actively growing, it is actively dying. You have to constantly give your faith what it needs to continue to grow. It can be tough. It is tough, especially in the circumstances that we find ourselves. It's a labor of love, and the reward ultimately will be worth it. Paul commends the Thessalonians for continuing to grow in their faith. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13. And we can receive praise for just the same. Back to the initial question. What are you growing in your garden? Are you growing faith? Are you growing all the other things that Bill has talked about the last several weeks? Because if your faith isn't growing, it is dying. If you need help with that, if you need encouragement, you know, sometimes that's all we need is encouragement from our brothers and sisters in Christ. There is no better place to find that than in this room. If you find yourself, as Jesus talked about, the thorny soil choked out by the cares and the troubles of this world, allow us to help. If you find that you lack substance, allow us to help deepen your faith. We've got an incredible eldership here that's willing to help you do that. You have brothers and sisters sitting right next to you that are willing to help you do that. Rather than if you haven't yet claimed the name of Christ, if you're not a Christian, you can be one. You can choose to grow your faith so that one day you can hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant, so that you don't find yourself sorted into that category of the tares. But so you can be gathered up to God's home in heaven for all of eternity. But brethren, if you're here tonight, I want this to be a lesson of encouragement. I don't want this to be just a negative beat down, if you will. Continue to add to your faith. Be an example for others. Continue to grow and grow and grow. Never be satisfied but constantly desire to grow closer to God, closer to your brethren, so that one day you can hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Brethren, if there's anything we can do to help you, please come as we stand and we sing the invitation song.